Philippians chapter. Yeah, <coughs> you don't care if it gets your yeah, face. Yeah, it's good. Just cut it off. Cut off the head. Okay, so Philippians coming off of Ephesians, as we just ended Ephesians. Um, so much of the practical in Ephesians that we looked at. Philippians now, um, we really get practical in some, some areas. Uh, but this has rightly been called the Epistle of Joy. And over 19 times the idea of joy or rejoicing is used over 19 times, as well as Jesus Christ, the name Jesus Christ, which is kind of interesting because really the overall message of the book of Philippians is Jesus is joy. Um, he's everything. Uh, and so Paul is writing, in fact, Philippians is a book that's written from prison, uh, but it's a different kind of prison. It's under house arrest. Um, and we know that from verse 1 of Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timotheus, or Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Speaking of the bishops and deacons at Philippi that they're writing to. And... Interesting, because Timothy would be there, and it would seem we know he could have visitors, Paul could have visitors under house arrest, um, which would be different from the, the other letters that he had written from prison, um, being in uh, the dungeon, which really was uh, in Rome, and, and the other letters that we've looked at already. Um, but here... This is a little different, and most likely he's um, having Timothy write this letter to him. And I was reading one of Jay Vernon's uh, commentaries on this too, and he likes to call it uh, a, a kind of um, long thank you note. That's what the book of Philippians can also be, is this long thank you note, and you'll see what what we mean just by chapter 1 tonight, um, Paul's heart and, and his prayer for the people is, is this whole thing, and it's very appropriate for Thanksgiving that's coming next week. So, um, But a couple things by what, just by the background of this book, um, it was God himself that led Paul and Timothy and uh, some of the, in their second missionary journey back in the book of Acts, to the area of Philippi. Um, they wanted to go all these other places. They kind of started out going these different places. In fact, the whole beginning of the church of Philippi is kind of interesting because it began, um, at least the way that the church was planted there in Philippi, it began with a sharp disagreement with Paul and Barnabas, who the Lord had set apart, remember, the first missionary journey, which was really successful. They planted many churches. They went, and it was it was just would have been, you know, full of encouragement, and Barnabas was known for his encouragement. Um, and yet something happened, this sharp disagreement, that we're not totally sure what it was, but something happened in that, and it caused Paul to split off from Barnabas, and he would then pick up uh, Silas, and also Luke uh, would seem in the writer of the book of Acts, is Luke, uh, would join in their second missionary journey in which they would go, and you can get all of this background in Acts chapter 16, but they would go to this area, and before being sent to this area, it says twice that the Lord forbade them. The Holy Spirit would not allow them to go, we would say, you know, to this city, to this area. The Lord just, and that's what I mean by God himself led them to the area of Philippi. Um, and when they finally get to Philippi, this area, there is not enough 
men uh, to even make up, well, Jewish men, I should say, in that city, in that region of Philippi, to make up a synagogue. And so we have the story of them going out by a river where Paul meets a group of women. And they are there praying at the river. And it's the hour of prayer, and Paul normally would, would have gone to the synagogue, um, but he ends up by this river with all of these women, um, and they, they know the Lord. And Lydia, the seller of purple, is one of them. And there's also a demon-possessed uh, fortune teller, who young girl that, that gets saved. Um, and it's just kind of a ragtag group of people that really uh, <laughs> reminds us of the disciples in a way. And it's, it's, it's exciting because I just wrote in my notes, you really never know who the Lord wants to convert and use to do His work. Mm -hmm. A demon-possessed girl, fortune ex-fortune teller, you know. Um, this, this lady, Lydia, that, that was prominent and probably pretty wealthy because she sold pur purple. Um, and not to mention, all of these people were Gentiles. <laughs> all of these people we're told about were Greeks. Prominently in that area of Philippi, it was not a lot of Jewish, not, there were not a lot of Jews. And so, this actually becomes the reason why I'm going through all of this. Philippians and the church at Philippi is the first church ever planted in Europe. It's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty big deal if you're uh, European, which I think most of us are probably in some way or another. Yes. <laughs> um, and so because of that, God sent Paul and, and God writes, uh, well, God plants this church here in Philippi and these people become very uh, beloved of Paul. And you can really get it in this first chapter for sure. In this whole letter, really. But um, So Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He is faithful to complete that work that he started. Uh, verse 6 is such an encouragement and... Uh, just a huge verse. If you don't already have it highlighted or underlined, um, get those pens out. <laughs> verse 7 goes on, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are uh, partakers of, of my grace. And God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ, or in my innermost being. You know. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere without offense, till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. So these first 11 verses there, that first section, is, is as I said, just very full of thanksgiving. You can hear Paul's great heart, um, his love for these people. And that's what, to be honest, that's what being a pastor is all about. Loving people. Uh, that's what being a Christian is all about. <laughs> it's not being annoyed with people like so many of us can be. It's not being uh, short 
with people like so many of us can be. But it's being patient, long-suffering, and having, look at verse 7 again, I have you in my heart. Exodus chapter 28, if you don't already have that kind of jotted down next to verse 7 there. Um, because we're reminded of the priests in Exodus chapter 28 who had these stones that would be placed on his vest over his heart. And also, didn't stop there, he had some on his shoulders. And the idea there is carrying the people of God, and for the priest it was twelve precious stones. Now, if you knew the twelve sons of Jacob, you can read about them in Genesis, right? <laughs> and on. <laughs> If you, if you know those 12, we would say those are 12 dusty mud cloth, cloths, um, very dirty and, and we would say worthless. But God tells the priest, no, you put these precious stones that represent each and every one of those tribes. They would become the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's, that's a diagram. That's a, an example for you and I as leaders. You and I as Christians, ultimately. Um, to look at people not as mud clods or dirty and worthless, but as gemstones, as precious, priceless, very valuable in the eyes of God. In fact, an eternal soul. They will spend eternity somewhere. Paul had that vision. Paul had that in his heart, on his mind, and in his heart. And the, the whole idea with on your shoulders was bearing the burdens of the tribes. <laughs> you know, as, as awful as, you know, Dan was, and as awful as Asher and uh, Levi and uh, the, the two sons... Uh, Simeon and Levi and um, just all of the problems that they had when we, we bear them on our shoulders like the priest we bring them up to the Lord in prayer now we're not literally like the priest were praying for the, a specific tribe of Israel are we we're praying for the people of God there's more than 12 of them <laughs> by the way there's a church, the whole church of God, and we pray for one another, we lift up one another. And in fact, if somebody is, you know, you just think of this person and it makes you bitter inside. You cannot forgive them. Um, you can't even stand the thought of them. What do you do in that situation as a Christian? You pray, you pray, you pray for that person. That's what Paul did, even for his enemies. Wow. Praying does something, and there's two reasons, really. Because for one thing, prayer works, and that person you're praying for will eventually know you're praying for them. And everyone will know, eventually. God answers prayer. But another thing that happens is it changes you and your whole perspective toward those people. Now, I'm not talking just bring their name up to God. But really spend time praying and thinking and meditating. Having those people on your heart. Whoever they are. Because that makes such a big difference in our lives as, as prayer warriors. Um, it should be also said, I meant to mention this earlier, because bishops is the same word as elder and also, it be, it's translated pastor in some translations. Um, and those three are very, they're just interchangeable words. Um, those would be those in the church at Philippi. There were bishops, um, teachers, or pastors, elders. The idea is the ministry of overseeing. And having somebody that oversees the whole church as a whole. And that would be a bishop, an elder. A pastor. Now, it says, and deacons. Deacons were people that served 
practically. They served in a very practical way, things that needed to get done. A lot of times it was physical, uh, the physical needs of, of the congregation or of the church. Um, would be many times that was deacons. In fact, the word di diaconos is servant. That's someone who serves. Um, and so these make up the church. <laughs> you you have bishops and you have deacons. And one small area that we get that is from Philippians here, ch uh, chapter one, verse one. Uh, that summed up the church in in uh, Paul's mind there. Um, so, when people think of you, <laughs> and when you think of other people, I mentioned being bitter towards some people, or it's hard for you to think, but look at verse 3. Do you have people in your life, and are you someone who, Paul might say, I thank my God every time I'm thinking about you. You know, we've, we can read through these things and we don't stop and really digest and really reflect on what does that mean? I hope that people thank God when they think about me. <laughs> and they're not cursing God when they think about me. <laughs> or, or, you know, and, and are there people in your life that you just thank God every time you're, you are in remembrance of those people? Always, in every prayer, making... Uh, requests with joy there's that first mention there in verse 4 huh. of joy <coughs> um, we'll kind of come back to that especially as we get, get further into the study but uh, verse 12 <clears throat> picking up I would ye should understand brethren that the things which happened to me have fallen uh, out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds, the chains that I'm wearing, me being under house arrest in prison, in Christ are manifest in all the palace. They all know, and in all other places. Verse 14, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing <coughs> confident to, by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of uh, contention, not sincerely, uh, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, not, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice. Yea, I will rejoice. Um, for I know, verse 19, that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to choose. For I'm torn or betwixt between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Jesus Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide and stay in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, 
striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in, in me. You're hearing that that same thing is going on. <laughs> it, it's interesting because he brings up life, he brings up death, he brings up the gospel earlier in verse 12 and on. In fact, you might underline the end of verse 12. Uh, not the end. Yeah, the end of verse 12. The furtherance of the gospel is the whole reason Paul lived. This was his passion. This was everything he was about, was the furtherance of the gospel. It did not matter what happened to him. He's in prison at this point. He's in house, on house arrest. In another place, he says, Though I am in bonds, or in chains, the word of God is not. That's an outlook. That's a perspective. See, God's word, or we might say the gospel, cannot be restricted, contained, locked up in a prison. Oh, they've tried over and over and over to destroy the gospel message and the and Christians and the church. It's been under attack from, the, from birth. And Paul's passion was, no matter what it took, he shared the gospel. And it's always kind of a, a fun thing. If you don't like your job, start sharing the gospel. <laughs> If you got a group of friends that you just can't stand anymore, start sharing the gospel. If you got family members that just bug you, share the gospel. Wherever you go, share the gospel. No matter what, because you can be restricted. We're only here for a little bit, a little time. James was very clear, isn't he? The book of James. You have but... Your life is but a vapor. It's, it's here today. You don't know. We don't know how long we have. Use it wisely. Like Paul, be interested in the furtherance of the gospel. In fact, do you, do you approve things? Verse 10. That's backing up to verse 10. Do you and do I approve things that are excellent? Because many of us approve things that are borderline. TV shows, movies, music. It's, it's, more, it's not just borderline, it's worldly. <laughs> it's absolutely a waste of time. And those are things we put our stamp of approval on. No, we need to be those that approve of things that are excellent. That is godly, eternal. Things that are of eternal value that, that, are, that will bring eternal life. Because many were looking at Paul, that's what verses 12 through 19, that, many were looking at Paul and doubting and saying, he's lost it. See, God's really mad at him. <laughs> that's why he's in prison. I mean, many of the churches and big pastors of mega churches in America today would look at Paul and say, what a failure. What a loser. He has nothing to show for his ministry. Like many of them look at me. Anyways. No. No, no, no. <laughs> um, but really, he had, in fact, it was quite the opposite. Here he is in prison. Now, you could go and see the churches he planted and talk to the people that read his letters that met him and you would begin to see the fruit. Which is, that's the only thing we are to judge by, by the way, is the fruit. We're to be fruit inspectors, not uh, looking for gifts of the Spirit, like so many do. 
They go from church to church looking for gifts of the Spirit. Gifts, gifts, gifts. No. Look for fruit. Be those that are fruit inspectors. Now, Paul was, again, um, only concerned with the gospel. And here he is in prison and he's not thinking about himself. That's so important for us. Because if I was in prison, that's my reaction. I'm worried about me, myself, and I. And Paul's outlook, we're going to get next week, Lord willing. Well, no, we won't be meeting next week. It's Thanksgiving. But when we get to chapter 2, you could read ahead. You get the mind of Christ. Most people call chapter 2 the Jesus poem. <laughs> and that's what it is. You get this snapshot into the mind of Jesus Christ. What he's like. And chapter 2 is one of my favorite chapters of all time. But chapter 1 here. I, we, we read one of my favorite verses of all time. We sang the song. It comes from Philippians 1.21. I love this verse. But it's convicting. Just like every other verse. All the good ones are. For me to live is what? Can you honestly sit here tonight? Can you honestly come to that verse and maybe not read it real quickly like many of us memorize verses? This one's an easy one for me. To live is Christ. But I just wrote some of these down. <laughs> we might say for me to live is paying the bills. For me to live is wealth leaving something for my children after me. For me to live is maybe pleasure. The whole reason I'm living is to find pleasure. For me, maybe for some it's fame. Wanting to just get noticed and become someone. Or for many, for me to live is the weekend. And they do. They put in hours and hours to get to the weekend. They're living for the weekend. For them to live is the weekend. <laughs> and it's such a sad existence when you, if that's really become what you're passionate about. And it's, it's important for us to honestly come to these things and really say, well, for him, for Paul, for him to live is Christ. If he began to focus on his circumstance, being there in prison, chained to a Roman guard, being under house arrest, having the glaring looks from even some of the um, so-called Christians or Christian leaders of his day that just looked and criticized everything about him. If he stopped and looked at any of those things, it would just bring worry, doubt, <coughs> depression, all of that. But for him to live is to look at Christ. It is Christ, ultimately. That's truly living. He found the secret to joy. And when you say joy, don't think your favorite team wins the game. That's not joy. <clears throat> it's happiness. And in fact, the very word happiness comes from happenstance. So if I write you a check for a million dollars, you're going to be filled with happiness until you get to the bank and try to cash it. And then it's just going to go away. <laughs> so there's, there's joy, and what joy is, is what Paul had. It's what hopefully many of us have. <laughs> what joy is, is Anything can happen around us, yet we remain in Him. We remain, we've got that goofy Christian grin on our face. Drives the world crazy. They tried to wipe it off of Paul's face. In fact, the early church, um, Polycarp, all of those martyrs, if you go through that little book, the the... Uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, you find these people that would go nuts because they could, they would not renounce 
their life, Christ, their joy, and dying with, with just total splendor, mm -hmm. total joy, elation. It's incredible. This hope that we have, this joy is not like any other. Many think they understand what joy is. They don't. <laughs> They're, they're talking about it, and it's all it is is happiness. When everything's going right in life, then I'm happy. But joy truly is that, that old acronym. I know it, it, it's true, though. Jesus, others, and yourself. In that order. Joy. Jesus first. <laughs> others. I'm, I'm going to think about others. And then yourself. At the end, that will, and you have that outlook, you experience joy. You really do. Cause, why? Because Jesus is joy. To live, to truly live, is Christ. Mm -hmm. And then, to die is gain. <laughs> you gain so much more. See, Satan, y'all know Satan, the devil? We just talked about him on Sunday night, Isaiah 14. <clears throat> Lucifer, that dragon from the pits of hell. Satan, a very real character, a very real person, wants to bring ultimately what? Death, destruction. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to bring death. What are you getting at, Mike? Jesus Christ desires to bring, what? Eternal life. Whosoever believes in Him will inherit, will have eternal life. Life to the fullest. For me to live is Christ. That's life to the fullest. Here's the thing. Here's what you need to understand. If you were sleeping the whole time, now wake up. Listen. <laughs> What Satan does, what the devil does, on your way to death, eternal death, he gives you little sparks, little, little uh, experiences of life all along the way. Take this drug, you, you experience life. It's incredible, this life. And in the end, you end up in total darkness, death eternal. On the other hand, Jesus Christ on your way to eternal life, you experience little bursts, little, little, little things of death, dying to my, what I want. I'm not going to watch that tonight because that's, that's my flesh. And it, it doesn't feel good to deny your flesh, to die a little bit each time. All the way to eternal life, you experience these little bursts of death, dying to yourself. Do you understand? That's so huge. When I first got that, it's so, it's, it's so foundational for every one of us to understand that. Because you understand why people are living it up in the bars. They get a little bit of life. <coughs> they get these bursts of life. What they think is life. It's really an illusion that the devil puts there. On their way to eternal death. And on our way to eternal life, we have and we should be experiencing and, and what, that's what he means. To die is to gain. Because every time I die in my relationship with my wife, every time I die to myself, I gain. That is, I, I experience more of Christ in me and less of me in me. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because it's so important for us to get this. This is how Paul lived. Was dying is the ultimate victory and gaining. Not in this life. He was not concerned with this life. He didn't care if he had a Porsche. He didn't care if he had horses and chariots. He didn't care if he was in prison. The fact is, everywhere that Paul went, people heard about Jesus Christ. In fact, the Roman guards would hear about Jesus Christ being chained to him. You want to change the world? 
Talk about Jesus Christ to everyone you come in contact with. Preach the gospel. I know it's very simple. I know you've heard this before. But you really want to make a name for yourself and go down in history as an apostle? (laughs) Preach the gospel. You really want to change the world and be an influence of good and not evil. And, And approve of things that are excellent. Preach the gospel. It's not the pastor's job to preach the gospel, by the way. <clears throat> the pastor, in fact, the word pastor, what, what's behind pastoring is simply feeding. It's feeding. And it's the people, all of you, I'm pointing to each and every one, every one of you, that go and preach the gospel. And where those people end up getting fed, that's on them. But we are to preach the gospel. We are all sent out. We're all, we need to be equipped to do so, but we have got to be obsessed with this like Paul was. He couldn't get this off of his mind. This is what he went to his grave just totally obsessed with. It was how he lived was was Christ. Um, I also love verse uh, 27, actually 26, going along with it, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. Like, everything you're about, let it be about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you share the gospel with someone? Is it something that you're familiar with? Acquainted with? You won't really know how to till you start. You gotta fail at it. <laughs> you gotta get out there and, and you know <laughs> you gotta be your worst critic and maybe you don't know all the scriptures, maybe you don't know what to say, but at least you go and you try. At least you're talking about Jesus Christ. You're getting someone interested in the things of God. And it's amazing, the the conversations you'll get into. The things that God will use that just comes up. And it's incredible because we are confound. We are um, confined, rather. We can be locked up. We can be uh, restricted. But the Word of God... And what you share about Jesus Christ with people is never restricted. It ends up going out into all of the world. It's awesome how God has really made it to be. So having one another over our hearts, on our shoulders, lifting one another up in prayer. We preach the gospel just like Paul did. And it's never about any kind of location. It's really all about our vocation. That's our calling. What we've been called to. We can sometimes be so interested on where we should live. Um, we could be so interested on what, what our job might be. What, what we want to do for a living. And we set goals and dreams and all of those things. But really, our highest calling in, in life, no matter who we are or where we are, your highest calling, and this is the highest calling, to preach the gospel (coughs) and do it, somebody said it best, if necessary, use words. Because people are not really interested on what you have to say, by the way. People are not interested on how well I prepare a Bible study. I'm talking about people in the world. They are not interested in hearing a really good sermon. They're not interested in hearing a well-prepared Bible study or a well-prepared thing. They're interested in real people. They looked at Paul being locked up in prison and they saw him singing praises to God. And it really got everyone wondering. It's the only reason people did not run when those they were thinking, what in the world's going on? These people are singing and the, the jail cells all open wide, 
What's going on? I want this. They're looking at Paul. He's really happy in this dark dungeon, chained and totally, I mean, you really want to want to get your, try and wrap your head around a story, read the book of Job. And you start to understand, wow, God is glorified in our weakness, in our pain so often. And it's hard, it's hard to come to grips with that, but it's also, there's so much purpose in it, isn't there? So, this is the same guy that said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. This is the same guy that said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. In other words, I wouldn't know what to do if I wasn't preaching the gospel. Those aren't just like snippets, but we those are goals. Those are what we should desire to be and, and attain to, to be, to live like, where we want to only preach the gospel. We want to change the world and change those around us by talking to them about Jesus. There's no wrong way to do it. There really isn't. Just be honest and know that everyone's watching you. <laughs> Even Satan. I always remember Job at the beginning there. He had God and Satan. And it was a battle over the soul. Over Job's soul. The only reason that he loves you is because you've been so good to him. Is that true? <laughs> that could be any one of us. As long as I'm healthy. As long as i got money in the bank. As long as this, that, or the other then yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. <laughs> but as soon as you get locked up in prison, as soon as everything's gone, like in Job's case, then the real, you know, you squeeze, you, you squeeze a sponge, you find out what's inside, right? God does that with us. <clears throat> he squeezes us. Sometimes He uses your wife to do it. Sometimes He uses kids to do it. But He squeezes you. Find out what's inside. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. How powerful, how uh, just amazing your word is. And may we have a passion for the gospel, for spreading the gospel, for sharing with others about Jesus Christ and about what you've done in our lives. Lord, may we learn how to do that. May we step out and... Lord, just be, uh, be excited about the things of, of God and keep us from approving of those things that are not so excellent. Keep us from worldly things, worldly passions. And Lord, help us to be set apart. Help us to be used by you wherever we go and speak to us. Even as we sing these last couple of songs, Lord, may we meditate on your word that we've read and May we just, just look into you deeper, Lord. We would draw closer and, and just desire that closeness with our Savior, our Master, our life, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I said it. <laughs>